I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, good morning, everyone. First, we'll, we'll talk about definitions, talk about classifications of bioplastics. What are they? What do they have in common? How do they differ from each other? Uh, and then we'll move on and talk about some of the important attributes of some bioplastics, which is biodegradability and the factors that impact biodegradability. And we'll touch on the consumer component. How do they perceive biodegradability and bioplastics? And why could it potentially be a problematic claim with respect to consumer understanding? And then we'll finish by taking a glance at the impacts that biodegradable bioplastics can have in various dispositions. We'll talk about that and we'll talk about collection systems and the final management of bioplastics and how that plays into their role in a sustainable circular economy. Bioplastics are types of biopolymers with plastic qualities. And we're all familiar with biopolymers. Uh, naturally occurring biopolymers would include proteins, polysaccharides, like sugars, cellulose, lignin, things like that. Petroleum-based plastics have been around for about 100 years or so, and they offer really incredible properties that we take advantage of, like strength, uh, lightweight, flexibility, customizability for all kinds of applications. And they also have the ability to resist degrading. And that trait is sought after for a lot of reasons, but unfortunately, it's also a bit of a, a liability in that they don't really follow the same pathway that those natural polymers follow and break down in the natural life cycle through natural processes of microorganisms. So that can create a problem, but also an opportunity for bioplastics. So why are they popular? I think that there's a couple main reasons they're gaining in popularity. First, they're seen as a sustainable alternative to conventional plastics and that issue. They do show promise to disappear quickly after use. And secondly, I think you know conventional plastics rely on non-renewable feedstocks, and bioplastics can be produced from renewable sources, which is often perceived as a, a more sustainable approach. Um, so we'll we'll take a look at that. The truth about bioplastics is that they are fairly complex. They do indeed have the ability to address some of the big problems that conventional plastics pose. Bioplastics that are made from bio-based sources, they offer advantages to petrochemical plastics with trade-offs. Production methods vary, feedstocks can vary with immensely different environmental and social implications. So even the way that a single feedstock is produced can actually vary based on how it's produced. Some bioplastics can biodegrade, and those that do may only do so in a specific environment. So it's important to think about what environment a bioplastic will be able to degrade in. And if that attribute is a goal, there are a complex set of factors that are all at play that have to align in order for biodegradables to actually achieve their purpose without unintended consequences. For instance, if you think about a compostable cup, a coffee cup, for example, you know, it's biodegradable. It may compost without an issue in a commercial composting environment. But infrastructure has to be available. If it's not, or if there's no means to collect that cup and deliver it to the composting facility, it may end up in the environment, may end up in a landfill and have a negative climate impact. You can imagine a, uh, a scenario where a consumer who is trying to do the right thing places that cup in their home compost pile because it says biodegradable on it or even compostable on it. So consumers are an important part of this, and they need a clear message on how to actually handle biodegradables during the life. So the takeaway um, there is that context matters, and many factors have to work together for uh, the benefits yeah. of bioplastics, you realized. Let's first talk about bioplastics and how we classify them. We're starting here because the term bioplastic is confusing. You know, it's used to describe a couple main categories of materials that do not necessarily have a lot in common with each other. So I just kind of want to parse these two definitions out for you of bioplastic. So first, a material can be a bioplastic if it is bio-based, meaning it's comprised of bio-based uh, materials, plant material primarily, rather than petrochemicals. Secondly, a material might be considered a bioplastic if it will biodegrade under certain conditions, like composting. Those would be materials that you see on the right side of that diagram there. Here's where it gets confusing. Um, not all bio-based plastics are biodegradable. And similarly, not all biodegradable bioplastics are bio-based. 
biodegradable plastics can undergo a process that's really enzyme driven to cause it to deteriorate and fully break down, if you will. And we'll look at those in a little more depth here. First of all, I want to frame the market for bioplastics. Globally, we have produced about 367 million metric tons of plastic. That was in 2021. An incredible amount of plastic. And it's especially incredible uh, sized up against the production size of bioplastics, which is shown here across all bioplastics. It's a mere 2.4 million metric tons. So a very modest contingent by comparison to your petrochemical plastics, but certainly a fast growing industry. So if we dig into that 2.4 million tons here, just a little bit more, you see a, a pair of illustrations from European bioplastics. It shows a, a snapshot of the bioplastics global market. On the left, you see last year's production and a kind of a breakout of the different types of resins that are part of that. And then on the right side, you see a five-year growth projection. The growth is rapid in this sector. It's anticipated to continue being rapid in the coming five years and beyond. You know, that market's estimated at over 7 million metric tons annually by 2026. These are fresh numbers from European bioplastics, but there are a lot of disruptions in supply chains recently. Perhaps those are, are being taken into account with these numbers. There's intense expansion, especially in China. Uh, they're expected to lead the biodegradable polymer market. And there's huge demand coming out of China, and they have big plans for added capacity. That capacity is dominated by PLA and PBOT. You'll see that I highlighted on green, on the right side of the uh, slide, the polymers that are expected to grow most rapidly. So do note PBOT, PCL, PBS, those, those resins are expected to grow very rapidly in the coming years. And also in the bottom right corner down there, notice I highlighted the biodegradable segment of bioplastics anticipated to grow more rapidly than the non-biodegradable resins like bio-PET, for example. What I have not shown here is the ominous projections for petrochemical plastics as well. So those are also looking pretty strong in the projections. So what's the value proposition for bioplastic? Like all of the products, they should be considered in terms of the value that they bring to specific applications and in terms of how sustainable they are from an environmental point of view. These impacts are most significant. The impacts that they, they do make are most significant in the production stage. So bio-based materials in particular have significant upstream demands for water, for land use, energy, chemical inputs during the agricultural stage, and they should be understood and put in, in comparison with alternatives for that same application. After the use phase, the end of life, uh, consideration of biodegradables should really be made in terms of a proper waste hierarchy. Can the products be efficiently separated for processing in a managed system? Is there a composting facility readily available? Is it likely to actually reach you know, an unmanaged system like the open environment? So we really kind of think about it holistically here um, when we evaluate the value that they can actually bring. I wanted to at least have a slide in here for reference that kind of shows you a little bit about these resins and really wanted to break out bioplastics in terms of the ways that they are produced. There's really you know, one of several pathways they can take. You can either take existing polymers, natural polymers, like starches or uh, cellulose or something like that, and you can modify it into a product where you can actually take sugars or some other monomer and actually build a polymer out of those monomers. And you'll see that's how PLA is produced as well. And the last one is PHA is, is sort of unique from the others in that it's actually generated internally by microorganisms. It's an energy storage mechanism for microbes that they, they produce when they overeat, so to speak. And they, they start storing molecules of PHA in their cells. And so you have to extract it from their cells in order to get it for use. They're very different in that regard. And, and of course, the vast differences in the way that they're produced will also have implications in, in terms of the environmental impacts to the process of uh, production producing them. In that theme, thinking upstream, we have to think about the sustainability of the production methods. And we just wanted to show the way we think about feedstocks for bioplastics in terms of generations. And really today, what we use is what we call first generation feedstocks. These are 
sugars, things like that. They're, they're much easier to take those monomers and build them into polymers or to take oils, take sugars and feed them to the microbes to make PHAs. It's much harder technically, and it's much more expensive to use alternative materials, cellulosic crops, for example, grasses, wood, bagasse, things like that, and actually get the building blocks that you need to develop the bioplastics. So that's where people are working very hard to try to kind of work up that curve towards second, third generation feedstocks. I will say, you know, third generation is, you know, people think of algae when they think of third generation feedstocks, but you'll, you'll see people referring to byproducts like the gas as being a third generation feedstock. This diagram that you're seeing here shows one metric by which you can evaluate sort of the sustainability of, of different bioplastics in terms of like the production yields per area of different crops. I think one of the goals of current production is to try to use crops that are very productive crops per hectare of land. Let's talk about actual performance characteristics. So moving on from the production stage to think about the actual performance in the use of the material. I think another thing I would call out is that you know, plastics frequently use a lot of additives, and these can really impact rates of biodegradation. Here you can see different kinds of properties that you might be going after if you are a materials engineer or a packaging engineer, you're making packaging from these materials. PLA has properties that would make it very well suited for rigid applications. However, it can be made into a film. Doesn't make a great water barrier, not great for long shelf life applications for that reason, but has very good mechanical optical properties. It's very good for 3D printing. It's good for food packaging applications too. Now, PHAs, you know, notice that they have great properties, are extremely versatile, good water properties, temperature tolerant, they can formulate, costs are very high. <laughs> starch blends, a TPS up there, thermoplastic starch, that's what TPS stands for. They're flexible, they're well suited for bags, like fruit and vegetable bags or bags for food scraps, things like that. You can actually make foam with it where it can be rigid. And you've, you've probably at some point had those strange packing peanuts that you knew weren't polystyrene film, but some alternative squishy material, and th those are made of starch. Let's look at end-of-life compatibility here. So you know, you've got all these different types of bioplastics with unique chemistry, performance properties, things like that. You might expect that there would be an equally wide variety of ways these materials would behave in waste management systems. And you'd be right in thinking that, actually. So bio-based polyolefins polyesters, you know, they're, they're chemically identical to their petroleum-based cousins, and they have the same level of biodegradability or, or lack thereof. Where infrastructure is available to recycle PET, that infrastructure can also be applied to bio-PET because it's chemically the, the same thing. A leading managed system for, for biological waste treatment is composting, and these systems provide activated conditions for breaking down biodegradable polymers. It's a managed system that isn't designed to take organic waste and biodegradable polymers included in that and break it down with heat and with the right moisture and nutrient levels that you need in the system. Many bioplastics will degrade in certain kinds of biological treatment systems. It's worth mentioning that the composting technology, the processing time, the local conditions, they all play a huge part in determining whether a product will actually compost. And this is why certifications focus on products, not just on materials. So products can be made from a wide variety of biodegradable plastics and achieve compostability in specific conditions. Now, the open environment conditions that contribute to biodegradability are really highly variable. And different materials or resins will behave differently from one another. So if composting is the leading managed system for certified biodegradable packaging, the question becomes, is composting infrastructure available? And is it available in Asia, for example? Well, it is fairly prevalent in rural areas of South and Southeast Asia. It's mostly focused on agricultural wastes, vegetative stuff, um, animal manures, things like that that would be produced on farms. Programs that are designed to take food waste from urban areas, including compostable packaging, well, they're not really well established in those population-rich areas. And that infrastructure really is lagging for recycling even. 
And considering that organics accounts for about half of the solid waste in the region, there's a lot of focus on it. So this is one of the reasons why people are thinking about how to actually capture the food waste and increase capture of it through use of things like compostable bags and such. Given variable performance between materials and managed systems, there are generally specific situations that make more sense than others to use biodegradable plastics. Now, the highest priority are applications over on the left where you have plastic that's inevitably released into the environment, and it's really hard to collect it. So think fireworks, agricultural film, like I was just mentioning a minute ago. Other times, you have plastics that are used to collect organic waste there, and they get sort of entangled with that waste and get very dirty, and it's hard to decontaminate. It's expensive. Think about food waste, bags or bin liners, things like that. Other situations where you have a variety of single-use biodegradable products beyond things like bags and stuff would be in a controlled venue like a stadium, or it could be like an office complex or something where you have the ability to really control the procurement and the types of things. And you're able to control where that material goes after it's used by the consumer. In another non-controlled environment, like think of a cafe or something like that, or a a restaurant where people are taking out food from the restaurant, they're going to go out there and it's very hard to get them into the right stream you want to collect them in for management. I guess one last thing I'd say here is that, you know, there are other applications that are kind of even go beyond the spectrum off to the right that are just not a good fit for biodegradables. Think of things like plastic bottles. Either you already have a decent recovery system to, to capture those, to recycle them, or you could create one if you don't have it today. In that situation, biodegradables would really lead to more contamination of the actual recycling stream for bottles. We talked about biodegradability as a characteristic of some bioplastics, but we haven't really talked about what it means. So just quickly want to touch on what it is. Ultimately, it's just the conversion of organic material into microbial biomass. These are microbes that are eating the material. And some of that material goes into and becomes part of their biomass. Part of it is released as carbon dioxide, or if it's in an anaerobic system, it could be methane. Ultimately, it's enzyme-driven. It has to do with the actual material that's being biodegraded, but that material is only biodegradable within the context of its surroundings, of its environment. So when we talk about a biodegradable material, we have to think about the material itself and the interplay of the environment that it's in. So quickly, just a technical look at what's actually happening in stages. So first of all, you have the polymer being broken down. It's a long chain of monomers that are connected to each other. This is where the polymer is actually segmented into smaller uh, oligomers or monomers. And then the microbes will digest it and convert it to carbon dioxide or methane, depending on the conditions. Like I mentioned, some of that will actually go into biomass. When we're talking about bioplastics, one of the topics we really need to touch on is oxodegradables. These are important. They're part of the, the narrative, and they're especially important in Asia where governments are increasingly banning traditional polymers for single-use plastic purposes in favor of biodegradable alternatives and compostable alternatives. So what are oxodegradables? They're really plastic additives that are added into conventional plastics like polyethylene to promote oxidation, which will fragment the material into small little tiny fragments. And the idea is that the fragments will be digestible by microbes in the environment. The concern is that these additives may cause fragmentation into microplastics that don't quickly get assimilated by microbes. And there really isn't sufficient evidence out there to show that they do fully biodegrade in the natural environment. And if they actually do, it's not clear what those timelines should be. Another unintended consequence of these would be if they made it into the recycling stream, they would compromise the integrity of the other resins that are part of that stream. I want to make the point here that conditions of the environment will determine how rapidly something biodegrades. So if you have a lot of microbes present on the right side of the screen over there, you're going to have more microbes that are emitting enzymes that can work on biodegradation. And if the temperature increases, that's going to lead to faster biodegradation as well. Composting, shown in the top right, is a 
managed way of actually evaluating things intentionally. Let's jump to a different topic altogether, which is the claims around biodegradability and guidance that is out there around claims that you can make. We put together a slide on some things that are happening in South and Southeast Asia related to plastics management rules, specifically as they relate to bioplastics in the region. India passed the Plastic Waste Management Act in 2016, insisting compostable single-use retail bags must be labeled as such. And they also have to conform to the Indian standard for compostability, which I believe is based off the international ISO standard 17088. Um, that would be. And they're, they're currently in the process right now of revising the rules, which would put more stringent standards around biodegradable plastics and adherence to standards that would ensure products that are marketed as biodegradable do actually fully biodegrade. Thailand and Malaysia have issued bans on OXO degradable plastics. Malaysia has scheduled banning single use plastics, and Vietnam has as well for tourist attractions in coastal areas. There's just a few of the steps that are being taken from a guidance level on these things. There's been research done to figure out what consumers think about bioplastics and biodegradable plastics and stuff. And essentially, what we know, because the, the takeaway here is that they really kind of hear bioplastic and they have kind of a positive reaction to it. They think it's advantageous, but again, they don't really understand what to do with them and how they're better. And there's actually, with bio-based stuff, there's actually confusion around what that means exactly. There's research showing that there are mixed positive and negative associations with bio-based. Some participants can be unfamiliar with it as a concept, or they might even think that it's biodegradable in their mind by virtue of being bio-based. So there, there is a sort of an epidemic of confusion associated with these materials. The last thing here. I wanted to show something that gets to the complexity of the sustainability of these materials. And what you see on the slide here, this is a result of a meta-analysis that the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality conducted, where they looked at, I think, something like 150 different life cycle analyses evaluating bio-based packaging. And to translate what's happening here, that green bars above the line are simply a count of the number of studies that they reviewed that showed that bio-based packaging was significantly better than non-bio-based packaging for that particular attribute. So like over here on the left, the green bar shows there were something like 18 of the studies found that global warming uh, impacts were better for bio-based. And then the bluish bar below the line shows the, the number of studies showing the opposite, that the non-bio-based was better. So the, the orange line is just the, the net of the, the green and the blue together. But just wanted to show that there are a lot of attributes on here that are strongly negative on the bio-based side. So a lot of these impact areas that, that you have for bio-based materials, you don't experience the same ones with, with fossil-based feedstocks. There's a lot to be said about this, but there's challenges in doing this because all the different papers and the research that's done, they, have, they use different models, they have different boundaries in their studies. They use different, even bio-based feedstocks like PLA. One will be PLA, another one's like a cellulosic, another one's a PHA. So, so it's very hard to, to find comprehensive insights across all of this. I want to just mention that I suspect that a lot of these were PLA oriented. And, you know, That's agriculture true. is very fossil fuel intensive, both from the use of, you know, direct energy, but also fertilizer is based on fossil fuels the combustion of those materials or use of those materials are direct correlations to things like acidification, smog, eutrophication, which is nutrients, you know, runoff from the water going into water and causing eutrophication. So a lot of these things that you see that are highly negative are really agriculturally related. That's exactly right. And I think one of the biases that is here there's a lot of biases in, in the data under, underlying this, but one of them is the fact that all of these studies, they're all looking at our first generation feedstocks. So when you move to second generation feedstocks, waste streams, industrial waste streams, byproducts from production of other things, that is going to have huge implications for how these things balance against each other. If you have two different bioplastic materials and you put them in the same disposition environment, 
like a landfill or incineration, an open dump, or release them into the environment, they can have very different outcomes. So PLA, you release it in the environment, in a marine environment or a freshwater environment or a landfill even, PLA does not break down readily because it needs certain conditions to to break into small fragments to begin biodegrading. Other things like PHAs will do that very rapidly. So they're going to have different profiles in landfill. They're going to have different profiles and results in the open environment. So you really have to think about individual materials in terms of how they stack up against each other, but also against even the incumbent fossil materials as well, because there are going to be trade-offs just looking at the end of life phase. We talked about what bioplastics are. You know, some of them may biodegrade in a given environment. The net environmental impact is dependent on upstream practices for production. And they also rely on a suitable end of life management that's intentional. And that requires things like infrastructure, collection access, consumer participation. And the, the biodegradability of these, uh, it's an attribute of a product, but really only with the context of a specific environment. So you have to talk about it in those terms. And lastly, you know, claims about biodegradability, they really need to point to a specific established standard and ideally be backed by certification schemes that are recognized 